Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to Care Week, the Center for Relationships Week of Free Services. I am AJ, I'm the brand director at the center, and I'm excited to welcome you all to the Fondness and Admiration Workshop led by Toya Foster and Danielle Duplishan. So for those who don't know about us, the Center for Relationships is a community counseling and outreach organization based in the Austin area. And we provide mental health resources through counseling and therapy for individuals, couples, families, and groups and also by providing mental health resources uh, for education, like the one that we have here today and until Saturday for the rest of Care Week. This is our eighth annual Care Week and it's our second year going fully virtual. Before we get started, I just have a couple housekeeping notes I wanna cover real quick. First of all, there are no materials that'll be needed for this course. Um, as always, you're completely welcome to write notes down. Um, and as I said before, there might be some things that if you're coming alone that you might want to share with a partner or a potential future partner that you might want to write down. So we welcome you to save anything you'd like. Without further ado, those facilitators, I'd like to introduce uh, this workshop, as I said, is led by Miss Toya Foster and Danielle Duplashan. Toya is a licensed professional counselor who provides comprehensive psychological care for couples and individuals. Toya is Gottman Level 2 trained and works with expertise in trust recovery, rebuilding relationships, family of origin issues, and anxiety and emotional support for life's everyday challenges. Toya believes in the potential of what has been broken or hurt to be healed in a safe, supportive, and non-judgmental environment. Danielle holds a dual bachelor's in sociology and international relations and is currently pursuing a master's in nursing to begin practicing as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Danielle's groups of interest include adolescents, young adults, families, and couples with a particular interest in situations involving BIPOC, spirituality, and incarceration. Danielle employs her nursing background to understand how physical health issues act as a source of stress and feels great joy to see clients begin to untangle distressing situations and achieve life goals and dreams once they have the foundation, tools, and mindset to thrive. And without further ado, I've just introduced you, so I'll let the ladies take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us for the fondness and admiration um, workshop. This is something that all of us pretty much do some talking about as we're working with our couples. This is a huge part of what helps couples relationships foster a, a sort of culture of appreciation and respect and fondness and admiration are two of the most crucial elements that Gottman, John Gottman of the Gottman Institute reports um, is important in a rewarding and long lasting romance. Um, because getting through stressful times and managing conflict right in the hard times of our relationship is much easier if you and your partner regularly show how highly you value each other. And um, John Gottman also says that um, successful long-term relationships are created through small words, small gestures, and small acts that, that people in relationships should cherish each other in their minds and express what they cherish. People in happy relationships also nurture and gratitude, nurture gratitude, sorry, for the things that their partner does and openly acknowledges those things to their partner. So right, there is a pattern and a theme here, right? Is noticing and appreciating and then verbalizing. If your relationship could use an infusion of gratitude and appreciation, listen up, because we've got some ways for you to strengthen your bond, get back on track and rediscover what you cherished in each other. This is a picture of Dr. John Gottman's from the Gottman Institute's sound relationship house as you can see it has seven levels because you know it's in the framework of a house seven levels um and the walls or the studs if you will that are holding the wall up or trust and commitment if you notice the second level of the sound relationship house is share fondness and admiration this represents that foundation part of you know the house the the culture and res respect and appreciation in your relationship. And it says uh, strengthen admiration and respect. Um, this is part of the friendship zone, 
that resides within a relationship. So in order for people to feel friendly and to treat one another like they would a really good friend, they need to respect each other and have some admiration for one another. When I work with um, new couples, they always sort of tend to want to skip this step. They claim it's one of their strengths um, and that they don't need any work here. And of course it's a strength. However, over time, as life gets more complicated with careers and maybe kids and pets and you know the pandemic and lots of other things that life brings us, um, this particular area begins to become challenging and stressful. And it's usually the first thing to go, right? We begin to talk to each other out of frustration and stress and not um, necessarily out of this uh, space of appreciation and gratitude. It is important that couples develop systems of fondness and admiration towards each other that last beyond the initial crush. Um, and it's sort of part of the unconditional love that you feel for each other that you certainly experience in the beginning of your relationship. But what we're talking about is how to hold that part of your relationship, of this thing, and um, you know, curate it, um, be intentional about holding on to it throughout your relationship. In addition to proactive fondness, couples have to learn how to show admiration for one another. Um, and appreciation. So appreciation is, exp is an expression of um, gratitude. So you'll hear me using those two interchangeably. Showing appreciation is primarily about saying thank you. Thank you for putting away the dishes. Thank you for, you know, cleaning up my mess at the table or, you know, thank you for putting the kids to bed. It's saying thank you, even if the person is doing something that they would probably do anyway. But it's making your life easier. It's saying thank you. And the truth is there's no reason not to include thank you as part of your everyday vocabulary to your partner. Thank you for making the bed. Thank you for passing the butter. Um, so that it extends into not what you do for me and into sort of who you are, right? Thank you, because this is who you are. You're someone who's thoughtful. You're someone who's kind. You're someone who's, you know, um, making sure that I have what I need. Um, sometimes if you're not sharing gratitude uh, towards one another for the who you are in my life, um, as part of the culture of your relationship, you can still reverse that direction and rebuild the relationship's positive emotional bank account by increasing um, where you spend your time, your words, and your focus in your relationship on um, sharing your fondness and admiration. Sometimes what I ask couples to do is to remember what first attracted them to their partner and to begin to nurture those things, those memories and those feelings, and to express what they admire and, and love, what they used to and what they still do. Because sometimes I say, if, if, if it doesn't count, if it doesn't come out of your mouth. So um, you might say, well, she knows I love her. She knows I'm grateful for all that stuff. Or he knows that you know, um, that it means a lot to me that he gasses up the car every Sunday. But if it doesn't come out of your mouth, it doesn't count because your partner needs to hear it. Um, in John Gottman's research, he found that couples don't need to be perfect and they're not. Um, having nothing but positive interactions um, isn't possible, but there's an optimal level of positive interactions to negative ones. And that's um, the 20 to one, 20 positive interactions to every one negative interaction. And you might be going like, whoa, that's a lot. Happy couples do this. In John Gottman's research, what he found was that just over the course of spending an afternoon together, partners are offering each other positive interactions. They might be acknowledging that I heard what you said. They might be, you know, making a cup of tea and make their partner a cup of tea unasked. They might adjust the volume on the TV for their partner. They might sit down, move to sit down and you move something off the couch or you cover your partner with a blanket because you're getting one, all positive interactions. <laughs> Excuse me. Couples report all the time that they love and respect and appreciate one another. But the truth is, is that sometimes it's hard to feel that, right? So we, we use our words to express it. Um, 
Getting back to Don, John Got, Dr. Gottman's research, on the thousands of couples, he showed that for your partner to feel loved, respected, and appreciated, again, you need to have at least 20 positive interactions for any negative interaction. So it's not that a negative interaction occurs and then you're counting like how many positive interactions do I need to have? It's just to, that to counteract that negativity, you need to have a lot of positivity. And if you have a lot of negativity and not a lot of positivity, then the relationship begins to feel hard, begins to feel, you know, more difficult, you begin to feel unappreciated, unnoticed, unvalued. Um, so actively looking for ways to let your partner know that they're important and valued, no matter how busy your day is, always finding a moment to connect, um, you know, giving a quick call or text to your partner in the afternoon just to see how their day is going. Um, looking for those things that your partner is doing right and then noticing them. Small things often. And then there's the magic ratio of five to one. This means that we need to have five times as much positive feelings and behavior with our partners as negative during conflict. So when we have a conflict, if you don't want to get inundated in a negative place, and if you don't want the conflict to go off the rails, the magic ratio is five to one. So five positive, positive feelings that you're holding while you're in that conflict to one negative. And this seems like an easier ratio to maintain, but from John Gottman's research, we found that couples um, actually wait a long time before they get this, right? If you don't have this as part of your culture when you first get together, it's hard to get. But once you do get it, it works, right? If you can begin when you're in a conflict to be mindful of the words that are coming out of your mouth and express, you know, maybe misunderstanding in the form of curiosity, if you can ask for more information rather than um, accusing or criticizing or blaming or showing up uh, defensively, then um, the conflict is so much more likely not to run off the rails, to go off the rails. Um, and in the research, John Gottman found that in conflict conversations, successful couples had five seconds to of time together in a positive or neutral emotional state for every one second in a, in a negative emotional state. So um, having a ratio below five to one within conflict spells trouble. And according to John Gottman's research was a potential for a divorce marker. So over time, if the positive negativity in the relationship was, um, higher than five to one, or let's say there was not enough positivity in the conflict. So the conflicts were very negative, then this would be a divorce indicator in Gottman's research. So this is really important to know and to work on. Gottman found 94% of the time that couples who put a positive spin on their marriage's history are likely to have a happy future as well. Makes sense. Fondness and admiration are fragile, right? That said, if you can remind yourself of your spouse's positive qualities, you can keep your marriage above water. And this kind of makes sense, right? When you're upset with your partner or frustrated with them or even disappointed in them, not allowing yourself to focus on the negatives, right? But to, to see if you can attribute those, whatever led to those uh, feelings um, to the person's stress level or to their forgetfulness or something, then you're, you will do much better than to attribute it to a characteristic of that person. Um, Gottman found it equally useful for overcoming negativity and hopelessness in troubled marriages. And that is to think positively about your partner, which is to increase the culture of affection and respect. So, some ideas that express kind of how this works is each day when you wake up, think one positive thing about your spouse, such as a trait you admire, a talent, something you especially like about him or her, a feature of your relationship that you like, right? Think about it every day. 
right? We're trying to increase the culture of affection and respect. The second thing you can do is to write down your thought on a piece of paper and put it in a place where you'll see it and think about it during the day, such as in your pocket, maybe in your car, on the dashboard when you're driving or on your desk. And during the day, especially when you and your partner are apart, repeat the thought silently to yourself and do this with a different thought, you know, a couple times, five, five times a week. This is how you increase the amount of, of affection and, and respect in a relationship, but also increase the culture of, of affection and respect in your relationship. Because as you rehearse the positive things about your partner, positive feelings about him or her will come more naturally, and it'll be easier to see the good things in your marriage. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense to you, Danielle? Oh, it sure does. <laughs> Ah, so we're going to talk about limerence real, um, for a little bit, or if you're a Texan like me, maybe the first time you read that word, it looks like lime rinse. But <laughs> the idea of limerence um, is the stage of a relationship, the very early periods, where everything seems really easy. And we kind of think of that as the puppy love stage, or you know, when you really first develop a crush on someone. Um, or kind of even going into a marriage, that really beginning stage of the honeymoon phase. And limerence is usually marked by, in a sense, like a near obsessive infatuation with the other person. And it's commonly associated with um, an overwhelming desire to have like your, um, your interest in the person reciprocated. And when we think about limerence, um, this stage can last anywhere from a year to two years in a relationship. And while, um, yeah, and we'll just go from there. So, um, you know, we're, we're in this beginning stage and it's like, I'm so in love with this person. They, um, I just love them so much. And you ask like, well, when did you know? And someone in the limerent phase would say, well, when I kept checking to see if they'd seen my Insta stories and they looked at them, or um, they text me and my stomach would do that flippy thing. And I just had butterflies all the time. Or um, if I was in a bad mood or I'd be in a bad mood when I hadn't spoken to them for a while. So um, when you kind of talk to friends and you realize that they're, these are the things that they're saying, you can really kind of pinpoint that, it, that as they're in a limerent stage. And the thing about limerent, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's an organic and a natural part of every relationship. What tends to um, make things a little difficult is when someone wants to stay in this phase forever because it's hard to really foster a relationship, a true loving relationship with someone um, that stays in the limerent phase. So if we um, go to the next slide, please. Um, this is when we kind of look at how people that are in the limerent stage think or what they think about, the object of their affection, the limerent object takes up a good amount of their time and their thought and their um, emotional energy. And when we look at someone who isn't in the limerent stage, there's more of a balance. Um, and we kind of know this to be true. Um, just kind of thinking about some of my friends who are in those beginning stages of relationships, what do we talk about? We talk about, oh my gosh, he texted me and he said this or she did that. Um, and they're still getting everything done. They're working, they're enjoying their hobbies, but most of our conversation and most of their energy revolves around the person that is the object of their affection. Um, and we think about people that either aren't um, in a romantic relationship or someone that is in the love stage um, that's in a loving, um, of true love um, relationship, there's a lot more balance there. So the relationship is important. It's not smaller than any of the other um, areas of their thoughts, but it's equal. And it's kind of looking at some comparisons um, of limerence and love. In the limerence stage, uh, people are more, um, kind of thinking about how can I obtain affection from someone? Like, I don't have it yet. What do I need to do so that I can have it? Whereas when we are in loving relationships, we can be confident in that um, we have our partner's affection and we can focus more on giving affection um, and being confident in our 
um, relationship with the other person. In the limerent stage, um, there's hormones that kind of um, run the course through our bodies in either the limerent or the love stage, but those, the hormones and limerence um, are testosterone, dopamine, adrenaline, those things that really help to bind us together and um, really kind of foster those lovey um, relationships and thoughts that we have. Um, and what we see kind of um, is more predominant in love is a vasopressin, something that is relaxed and that's um, a, a hormone that relaxes and calms us, uh, like oxytocin. That's um, a hormone that we see in childbirth that again helps to bond, but bonds in a more calming and um, um, binding way. With limerence, we see the object of our affection as perfect and without flaws. It's so early, there's nothing wrong with that person. He's great. Oh, okay, maybe he does have this minor flaw, but that's not, that's not bad. I'm really just not gonna think about it right now. And as we move more into a loving relationship, we can see our lover's flaws. Okay, it really bothers me sometimes when my boyfriend doesn't put the toilet seat down. And, you know, so we can kind of recognize those things, but still love our partner and love them through that. Um, another kind of thing about limerence is that there's, there's highly a lack of commitment and that brings a lot of stress and frustration. Uh, I want to really date them. I want to move this forward. And there's so much emotional energy that goes into that, um, that is just sometimes very overwhelming. And as we move into a solid foundational relationship, again, we have that calm and relaxation. In love, we have clear communication. Um, or that we hope to have clear communication. And in the limerence stage, there's a lot of, okay, I can't text back too quickly. If I text too quick, they're gonna think I'm weird. Um, well, if I send too many messages or I can't say this about myself because they're gonna think this about me. There's a lot of mind games and kind of different things that go on in the limerence stage. But as we move into love, we can be clear, we can be open and have that trust that our partner will accept us um, and love us for who we are. And in the limerent stage, there's a lot of things like where just every moment of the day you're thinking about the other person um, and it just takes up a lot of space, which in a loving relationship, again, there's that balance where I can actually spend some time not thinking about my partner and that is okay. Doesn't mean I love them any less, but that I can, um, give balance and um, importance to other things. And when I kind of think about an image of limerence, um, I don't know how many of you guys have ever had cocoa puffs or seen the commercials with the toucan. And his saying was, I am cuckoo for cocoa puffs. And that I think is a really great image of what limerence can be, that we are cuckoo and head over heels for the other person. <laughs> Excellent. So true. <laughs> um, oh. go ahead <laughs> I was going to say how do we stay in love once limerence is over some might say your blinders come off or they wear off and the romantic attraction might still be there but it's not the main driver that keeps us together we've gotten a, a heavy dose of those good hormones and a more foundation uh, a more foundation for which to put our, our, you know, get relaxed into and build our relationship on. We're more balanced. And here is really where maintaining that culture of appreciation and respect is important. When we're in the love phase, because we probably show up with a lot of it in limerence because we want to be kind. We want to be appreciative. We want to express our gratitude. We want to be affectionate, right? Um, and so this is what, when we're in the love cycle of our relationship. It's what allows us to stay close and connected to one another. So no matter what I tell my couple is no matter how busy you are, right? Put at least, put aside at least 20 minutes a day to simply talk to each other and connect. It seems really small, but it's huge. If you're, if you can do this every day with intention, then the emotional connection will have right the wings to keep going and be there when you really need it in your relationship. 
I know that especially during the pandemic, lots of people were at home working from home and taking care of kids and having to prepare meals and all of that stuff. And it didn't seem like there was time to do it or it just wasn't convenient. But I encouraged my couples to continue to talk, talk to each other and find a time to emotionally connect. Um, because if, I should say when, but I'm gonna say if life chips away at your fondness and admiration for each other, the route to bringing them back begins with realizing how valuable they are, right? When you find yourself in a situation where you're not in a relationship that supports a culture of fondness and admiration, you realize how valuable they are. Jump back in and start working on building that culture. By authentically offering fondness and admiration to each other, we're focusing on what we cherish about one another. And then we're sharing those thoughts with our partner, right? Maybe you love their kindness and their compassion and you tell them, or maybe the way they make you laugh out loud, you know, when they tell a corny joke, don't just think it, but tell them. I'm often reminded of this in my own home, own home because I have kids, right? And with kids, we, we have to be sort of I find myself needing to be over verbal and expressing a lot of appreciation when they do things, even the small things and offering them gratitude because I'm trying to model that for them. And, you know, of course I'm showing them fondness, but remembering that kitten, it's not just something that I need to do for my kids. It's something that I need to do for my partner too, that we all appreciate that. Um, um, and this, I'm, I'm going to say it, but sometimes it's overlooked. People who are in happy relationships like each other, right? Yes, they love each other, but they also like each other. When you like someone like you would um, a good friend, a BFF or something, then it's easy to foster a culture of fondness and, and inspiration. Because when we can do that, we can overlook each other's flaws and weaknesses, and those things then don't threaten the relationship. And it's important because if you have a partner who leaves their socks or their dirty clothes on the floor or, or who's allergic to washing dishes, right, you can get sort of upset because they didn't wash the dishes, but it won't become a deal breaker for you because both of you are modeling what it feels like to be loved, supported, and appreciated in the relationship in so many other ways. And actually, um, in Gottman therapy, fondness and admiration is the, the level that we use to help couples that have one of the four horsemen named contempt in your relationship. When one partner is feeling contempt towards another one, fondness and admiration is the antidote. Contempt can be a dangerous emotion that you know, partners in a relationship develop towards one another as the years go by. It's a feeling of looking down on someone with superiority. Feelings of contempt can quickly break down the bonds of friendship between partners. Why? Because it erodes that fondness and admiration. If you're behaving contemptuously towards me, you know, every now and then or a lot, then I'm gonna stop wanting to be around you. And I'm going to stop being positive or feeling positively towards you. I'm going to start feeling negatively towards you. Um, another way to connect is to add some rituals of connection, right? When you connect, you're bringing forward the fondness and admiration and add some rituals of connection. Carve out time to exercise together or take short walks together around your neighborhood. You know, start your day by hugging and giving each other a smooch first thing in the morning. And then when you return home in the evening, make that a ritual of how you two connect. Um, or plan an at-home date night once a week. Be, and be, just be creative to make sure that you're fostering and being intentional about um, staying in love. This stay in love exercise, I'm, I wonder, Danielle, if you could um, help do a demonstration with me. Of so course. this exercise, thank you. This exercise is from the book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, where Gottman introduces an exercise to help couples rediscover or discover fondness and admiration in staying in love. So the ideal idea here is to pick um, three positive adjectives among the list um, that describe your partner 
and then name the situations where your partner recently showed those qualities and then, excuse me, tell them about it. The idea of this exercise is not to do it once and end it, but to use this to sort of kickstart a habit. So I'll start, Danielle. Um, um, let's see. I wanted to say how much I appreciate how committed you were to um, helping our daughter Chloe um, deal with her emotions around our goldfish, her goldfish passing away. Um, honestly, I was probably just going to dispose of it and just let her imagine what happened, but you really hung in there with her emotions and had a funeral for the goldfish. And I just wanna say that I really appreciate the time that you took to make sure that she was okay. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it was just a really, really important moment. I wanted to be there for her. Thank you for noticing. And one thing I noticed, um, what I was thinking about today is when we, you know, my, my birthday was last week and I was just so surprised at everything that you put together. And I, I know I haven't mentioned it to you, but really just your, you're like, you like, you have a gift of hospitality and just Aww. getting all of our friends together. And I really appreciated that. And I just felt so loved in that moment. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Um, yeah, I think that was great. And so, um, you know, finding um, adject positive adjectives to share with your partner can be really powerful and can be a wonderful conversation starter. So I want to ask the participants um, in this um, workshop, if you can turn to someone you might be in a room with, call someone, text someone, and maybe practice. Practice calling them and offering them some positive adjectives, maybe one that's on the slide or one that you think of on your own. Um, and give them an example of when they exhibited this positive trait to you. Let's give it about a minute. Almost there. I'm wondering, um, I'm going to ask uh, to hear maybe some positive adjectives what anyone was able to come up with. Okay, and that's about a minute. If you're having conversations or if you've texted someone or you've called someone, please feel free to continue that conversation. It's important. If anyone did reach out and share or have a thought about something, a positive adjective that you think you might share with someone, um, if you don't mind, just put the adjective in the chat box and share it. Whatever that adjective is that you're thinking about that you can attribute to someone that you're appreciative of, of something that they might have shown you recently. Or maybe it was something that you did recently to someone else in the spirit of being loving or kind or relaxed or tender. Anything in the chat? Quick, she okay. said, my partner, my partner was committed and I was tender. Oh, yes, I love it. Yeah, I'm going to tell you guys a little secret. I keep a list of positive adjectives in my bathroom because sometimes I need help right? Remembering to do this or remembering some positive adjectives. And I can tell you that 100% of the time, this brings, when I bring up these positive adjectives in whatever way I bring them up, 100% of the time, it, it plasters a big smile on my partner's face. And I end up dusting myself off a little bit. And I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm, I'm honestly not being manipulative, but I want to be able to cult, um, cultivate this culture in our relationship. I also want to model to him what I would like, but more importantly, above all, 
I want to be able to give him his flowers. I want to tell him how much I appreciate him. Hey, running the house that I live in is not a one person show. It takes two people showing up, working in the ways that we show up. Sometimes that's together. Sometimes it's not. It doesn't matter. It takes all of us. And I, and I do appreciate that at the end of the day. And so I'm reminded when I open my drawer to get out my toothpaste, there the list is, and I see it. And maybe as I, we get in the bed together, I tell them, oh, I really, you know, I'm feeling so close to you right now that you packed, you know, our kids lunch and you made me a lunch too. I really appreciate that. When I opened the fridge, I was so surprised to see it. Big smile. Okay. Creating shared meaning. The second level of this exercise is to go deeper. So we're going to use the positive adjectives that we just came up with in the first exercise, and we're going to take it deeper. We're going to explore with our partner or our person or our friend or whoever we reached out to about why, right, you're offering me this, offering them this appreciation or the virtue that you picked. And then articulate why they're important to you. So I'll demonstrate with you, Danielle, again. Wait, what was the adjective I picked for you? Loving, oh, committed, committed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Danielle, you know, um, I was telling you how I really appreciated how committed you were with, you know, uh, Goldie the Goldfish's, you know, passing uh, with Chloe. And I really appreciate that. And I just want to say that I can honestly say that when it comes to taking care of things with our family, that you're always showing up in a very committed way. You're always making sure that we have what we need and going the extra mile when we don't have what we need. And that's one of the things that I really love about you, that I can always count on you to put us first. Oh, yeah, thank you. That was so kind. And I feel so good just getting to hear that. And I and that's something that you think, but thank you for sharing that. And you know, yeah. just had the further thought when I was thinking kind of about uh, the party that you threw and like just how hospitable you were. And that that's something that I kind of struggle with, you know, kind of putting things together and uh, helping our home to be. Um, just a very smooth running place. And that's something that you do so well. And I really feel that we complement each other in that way. And um, it's just so, like, you are just such an important person to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That means so much. Yeah, I know that's not your strongest suit. And so I'm happy to take care of doing that. And um you know, when you share these things with each other, it just can help the conversation to flow and to keep going in a very positive and uplifting way, a loving way, if you will. If I've learned anything at all in my years as a couples therapist, it's that no two relationships are even kind of the same. People come together in the strangest and most wonderful ways that you can imagine. They may have the same kinds of struggles, but they'll each have in them different ways. When couples are thriving, they're thriving in different ways too. And each friendship, right, looks differently. All of everything that we bring to our relationships and to our friendships is different based on our own individual experiences. Um, each couples also have different strategies for managing conflict. And each couple dreams differently about the future. I've just named pretty much all of the Gottman Sound relationship house levels, but I'm getting to something here. The couples that are the most, most fun to work with are those who are able and eager to create shared meaning. This is at the top of the Sound relationship house, right? They are couples that say, hey, let's have, let's do something every week, like a Saturday hike or Wednesday lunch. By building these rituals in early in their uh, relationship, they habitualize their connection to one another and it keeps them tethered to the relationship. It's fun because these couples understand that no matter what's going on in our work world, in our world at large, in our family, I'm prioritizing you. I'm showing up every Wednesday for our lunch that we have together. I'm taking your call, you know, every morning when you get to work, you call me. In addition to establishing rituals, 
premarital couples or newlywed couples really have an opportunity to explore goals and symbols together, which is part of creating shared meaning. Like, what does home mean to you? Right? I'll ask you, Danielle, what does the meaning of home mean for you? For me, home is my safe place um, where I can come and rest and really just rejuvenate and be myself or kind of like relax and um, rejuvenate. Mm. That's what home means for me too. But guess what? For, for my partner, home means Grand Central Station. It means a place where he comes and be, even before he gets home, his friends are already here. <laughs> it's a place where he wants to come and be in his environment and relax and socialize. And I'm like, ah, but you know what? I can't really complain because I talk for a living. I talk all day. And so this sort of gets me off the hook. I don't have to do a lot of talking for him because at work, he's quiet. So he gets to come home and socialize with his friends and we compromise like by seven o'clock, they gotta go. They gotta be gone by seven. So it's a win-win. But questions like understanding, um, you know, getting to an understanding between both of you, like what does home mean? What does sex mean, right? For some people, sex doesn't mean intercourse. For some people, it does. What does money mean? What does play mean, right? I often tell my couples, hey, have a good weekend and go play. And occasionally they'll say, what do you mean? And I'll tell them, what does it mean to you? And I'll ask the other partner, what does going to play mean to you, right? Those things are important. And when you both talk about what those things mean to you, you're creating shared meaning in your relationship so that you're both um, having the same understanding. Doesn't mean that you both under, uh, agree to the same thing, but I know what you mean when you say, do you want to play? And I know what you mean when you say, do you want to play? It's important to create shared meaning. And it's only possible if you like each other, right? So you have to like each other. So, okay, Danielle, can you share some tips for sharing fondness and admiration between couples? Yes, so let's, uh, tip number one. So the first tip is to give your partner genuine compliments and share how proud you are of them. And this is something that we have been practicing, but what's important um, is to know that Sometimes people will think, well, my partner knows how I feel about them. They know that I like this trait in them. And what we, what the Gottman research shows and what we've even seen in practice is that everyone still likes to hear uh, nice things said about them. And sometimes when, um, when a partner will share a genuine compliment, the, part, your, the other partner actually doesn't know that you think that about them. And if we keep sharing it in our heads and not with our partner, there's no way that they can know. So um, just being um, forward and saying, I really appreciate this about you, or I'm proud of you um, for the way that you are being um, the leader of our family mm -hmm. and taking um, extra time to make sure that we're cared for and supported. And hearing those things like, no one doesn't like to hear that. Um, and when it's genuine and from the person that you love the most, how meaningful that is. Love it. Tip number two, catch your partner doing something right and thank them. Um, Toya mentioned earlier, just how, again, how good it feels to be thanked, even for small things. And a lot of times we always catch people doing the wrong thing and pointing it out. You didn't do this, you didn't do that but how nice it feels um, when someone says, thank you for taking out the trash today. You know, I, I meant to, and I just got really busy and I didn't get to do it. And when I got to it, it was already done. Thank you for making my day easier. And when we point out things that people do right, a lot of times it spurs them on to do more things um, that we appreciate because our brain loves to receive um, admiration and fondness from someone that we love. So in catching people doing things right, we help them um, to do more right things. Mm -hmm. Tip number three, share a fun or favorite memory from your past together. 
just taking the time to reminisce about your life um, as a couple and as a like as a pair you have lived so much time together even if it's a brand new kind of more budding relationship or you've been married for 20 or 30 years you have lived a lot of life together um, reminisce about your wedding day or when, um, when you guys first started dating what were those times like and sharing those memories um, that make you both um, just kind of laugh and enjoy each other's time and company. Mm -hmm. Tip number four, um, number four, excuse me, build new rituals of connection with your partner. So this is, um, I told you I talked a little bit about this, but when we can build these rituals of connection, even if they're not there yet, um, it's, it's neat when we can kind of do this at the beginning stage of a relationship, but even um, if you have been with your partner for a long time, it's like, oh no, we haven't done this. Start something new. Um, one of the things that John Gottman mentions that he likes to share with his couples um, is what he calls the six second kiss. And in the six second kiss, that's, that's a pretty long time. Um, in a relationship or, you know, when we're used to maybe just doing pecs here, a little pecs there, but daily um, in the morning before going to work or every evening, sharing a six second long kiss and kind of building that intimacy again into your day. And the research um, shows that couples that did this, at least for the male partners, it extended their life by 10 years. Wow. wow. Just <laughs> by bringing shared um, a more shared intimacy into the relationship but different rituals can be having a date night either once a week or once a month and really sticking to it really sticking to that date night because we can plan 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 and say well this is would be a great thing to do but sticking to date night or taking time um, to have deep and full conversations about um, your relationship so that can be, as Toya was mentioning, talking about um, uh, money or sex or different things like that. Having these deep conversations that sometimes can be a little bit awkward, but in building this habit of being able to have deep and meaningful, sometimes hard conversations, we're allowing our relationship to thrive and really foster in a loving, um, in a loving situation or a loving air. And tip number five, tell your partner you love them every day, every day. Um, my heart swoons and just overflows when someone says, I love you. My partner or friends or family, I love to hear I love you. And I love to share that with people. Um, and I think when we are in um, happy periods, this is really easy to do, but even remembering in hard times or if there is a fight or an argument that even in those times it's very important to say i know we are disagreeing right now we're having our hard time but i think it's it, and i think it is important for me to let you know i love you and i love you i love you i love you and we will get through this and how reassuring to the relationship that is um, going on to tip number six i'm going to pass it back to Toya. Thank you. Be physically affectionate with your partner, right? Uh, affection and physical affection is part of most people's relationship, but remembering that both people need physical affection. Kiss them, hug them, hold their hand, cuddle up to them. This goes a long way in expressing fondness and admiration toward your partner and of your partner. Express appreciation, right? We've been talking about this throughout the whole presentation. And there's this thing called the appreciation effect. Gratitude strengthens relationships, which improves physical health, which improves psychological health, which improves self-esteem and increases mental strength. Appreciation is one step further. When you appreciate someone, you feel grateful while creating gratefulness in them too. That's the appreciation effect. It's an exchange of joy and meaning and connection that does wondrous things, not only in our personal lives, 
but we can even take this into our workplaces, right? And in our, into our profession, right? All of those things, when you feel grateful um, towards someone or something, you create gratefulness in them too. So it's contagious. And this is huge, expressing appreciation. If you don't believe that the appreciation effect is true, I dare you to try it. <laughs> Tip number eight is to surprise them. Who doesn't love to be surprised? I do. I love, no, who doesn't love to be surprised? No, not me. I love to be surprised. <laughs> and I got a surprise the other day. I was just at home doing my thing. I was on my jam and I got a text that said, someone has sent you um, those cookies. Uh, what are they called? You know, when someone delivers you cookies, huh? Wasn't it Tiff's Treats? Tiff's Treats. Someone said, you, someone is sending you some Tiff's Treats. And, and I was just holding my phone like, oh my God, who's doing this? Who's sending it? And I was checking my texts and my emails. I didn't find anything. So it's like, put, you know, what time you want this delivered as soon as possible in one hour later on today. I was like, send me my cookies now. So I pressed now and, you know, they delivered the cookies and I couldn't wait to open them and see who brought it to me. And I was thinking my sister, my friend, you know, my partner, my kids, teachers, right? I'm, I know I'm a great kid's parent. Uh, anyway, it was the roofing company. I had had my roof done after the storm and they sent me these cookies. Totally unrelated, not totally, but you know, it wasn't from my partner. But the truth is, is that we all kind of like to get a, a surprise telling us that someone's been thinking about us. Someone has made us feel special and someone took the time to make it happen. So surprise, you know, your partner every now and then with something and see how it makes them feel. Tip number nine, plan a date, right? My partner and I would do dates, which, you know, might not sound like dates. We weren't going out of the house because of the pandemic, but, you know, it wasn't that we were just still awake after the kids went to bed. We were intentionally saying, okay, we're going to watch this. We're going to do that. We're going to drink this. We're going to, okay, I'm going to make these cookies now that the kids are in the bed. We would have a date and we would just sit up and talk. I even have that app on my phone. There's an app that you can go outside, right? It needs to be no clouds in the sky and point the app up in the sky and it'll tell you what constellations are up there. And we loved doing that, especially when it was cold outside. We'd go outside and hold it up and we'd point them out and look at it. Can't, some of them you can't really see with your bare eyes, but we'd look at the app and then you can take a picture of it. And then the next day we'd say, see what we found? Um, it's created some problems because the kids wanted to do it because they need to be in the bed so anyway but it was a great thing to do that my partner and I would do together and he would say hey you want to go outside and see if there's any constellations of <laughs> yeah of course I do so it's great plan a date tip number 10 write them a love letter right if this said write them a love text I'm all over it right I don't I'll write a love letter same sentiment Tell someone you love them and why. Tell me the reasons why. And I, my partner will try to tell me sometimes, you know, I love you because of this or because of that. And I'm like, yeah, put it in a text, right? So that I can get it and have it and reflect on it when I need to hear it. Um, but anyway, it's really nice to get a note from someone letting you know that you're thinking about them. I mean, the options here are endless. Whatever way that you express your admiration, make sure that you do so more than you express your negativity, right? When you both feel loved, admired, and appreciated in your relationship, it sets the stage for romance and passion to flourish. It may take a few months to build all of these suggestions into your relationship or even some of them, but over time, regardless of how busy you are, if you're intentional about it, you'll find yourselves on the right track, feeling valued and offering value and love through a whole new culture of appreciation. I wanted to share this quiz. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a shorter website address. But if you'd like to take a fondness and admiration quiz, write down this website address. It's a free assessment. You just sort of uh, hit the radio buttons for, to answer the questions. 
and and then you score it and it'll tell you right if you're feeling admired and and fond in your relationship and some ways to help you do that I hope that you all have enjoyed this presentation by Danielle and I. I think we had a fun time together and we enjoyed doing presentations together. And I hope that you did too. Thanks so much, Toya and Danielle. This was a great workshop. Uh, it was amazing to participate. I got so into the exercise that I forgot for a second that I'm working. <laughs> I have a workshop uh, to facilitate, but that was amazing. Uh, we have one person says, thank you. Great presentation. Another says, very good presentation. Lots of helpful info. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, all right. We have one question. Shall I read it out for you? Uh-huh. Okay. Are there are there suggestions for effective ways to share with your partner that you need more fondness and affection from them? Mm-hmm. Depends on your personality, but for me, when I need more, then I give more. And I'll say, because I'm seeing my partner smile, or you know, I can tell that they're really liking it. And I'm like, yeah, I want you to do the same for me too. Sometimes when I'm tired or you know, just need to connect with you, I need you to see me. And he gets it right away. If that doesn't work, then you might just say, hey. Can we begin to do some of the things that we talk about to build this culture of gratitude and fondness and admiration in our relationship so that I'm making sure that I'm giving it to you and you're making sure that you're giving it to me, right? So you're not sort of blaming the other person and saying that I have this need that you're not taking care of. You're sort of saying, let's do this as something that we want to be intentional about in our relationship. Danielle, what would you say? I really like that first one. Um, I like to uh, kind of give and then uh, as you're building that it is um, or it should flow back to you and I'm um, mm -hmm. just being very um, kind and open with saying, hey, can I have some of this too? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. To ask for what you need and sort of be it's a little bit more of a direct way. But if you have that relationship with your partner, nobody's getting offended. I'm just asking for what I need. Because if you need something, please come tell me, right? I, I'm here to take care of your needs. You're here to take care of mine. Sometimes we don't always remember that. So if I forget, then let me know. I'll admit something. When I first um, you know, got in, I'm in a long-term relationship. When I, I hated breakfast. I didn't eat it and I didn't cook it. But I got in a relationship with someone who their favorite meal of the day was breakfast. And he would say, how come you don't ever cook breakfast? And I would say, mm -hmm. I, I was like, for the love of God, please don't ask me to cook breakfast. He asked me to cook breakfast. I cook breakfast now because it means so much to him. Mm -hmm. I still don't eat breakfast, right? I might eat a banana or something. I don't who wants to go to the stove that early? No, but I cook breakfast for him because it makes him happy. Now that's appreciation. That's fondness right there. Mm -hmm. Toya, we do have, we have one more question that was in the chat. Um, I tossed it to you first. Um, so someone asked, did I hear correctly that when I feel contempt from my partner, my showing appreciation may be an anecdote or an antidote? Yes. And more, more to the point, though, to stop getting contempt in your relationship, it's to foster the spirit of fondness and admiration. So you can, the antidote for contempt is to show appreciation, but if it's showing up a lot, to begin to foster this, the spirit of fondness and admiration, that takes the place of contempt, because Contempt is just a complaint, right? It's a negative complaint. And you, so you're taking that complaint and sort of focusing on the positivity, on something positive. And it's not that when you have a culture of, of um, fondness and admiration that there isn't any complaining in your relationship, but when you complain, it doesn't sound like a criticism. It sounds just like, hey, I have this need or there's this thing. You 
you say it in a more positive way. You don't feel so negatively about it and you don't make a big deal out of it. And you certainly don't want to hurt your partner's feelings because of it. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have one more question in the Q&A box. Um, and the person who asked that says, that's gold, I appreciate it. So thank you so much for asking. You're gold too. Yeah. Uh, the Q&A question says, can you go over the magic ratio of five to one in conflicts again? That is an area of struggle for my partner and I. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you also to, um, to Google the magic five minutes. So wait, let's see, the magic ratio. The magic ratio is five to one. That's what it says right there on the slide, okay. We need to have five times as much positive feeling and behavior with our partners as negative, conflict, as negative during conflict. When I have tried to share this with couples and couples counseling, it's not that you say, when you slam the door, when you get upset, it really bothers me because it lets me know that you're angry and, up, and upset and you walk away, you don't come back and apologize. It's not that we're, I'm gonna say that and then say, um, you know, but I love you, or, you know, those pancakes you made this morning were banging. It's not that I'm just gonna randomly add some positivity in there to add, to get to the five to one. But um, what we're gonna do is for every five seconds that a couple is, able to stay in a positive emotional state for every one negative state, then that overtakes the negativity. So it isn't something that actually happens in one conflict. It's a culture. It's a way that you communicate that when you have conflict, it's less negative because you're talking to each other generally in a more positive way. You're more conscientious of hurting or or the making sure that the intention of what's happening isn't going to hurt your partner. Mm, outside of those conflict discussions, um, your positive to negative conversations should be 20 to one. So when you do go down and have conflict, you're, you're still at a five to one ratio. If you go from 20 to one to pop to five to one, the positivity has come down but it's still at five to one. So you're still not going for the juggler. You're still not, you know, pointing at the front door. You're still not threatening. You're just expressing your anger, your sadness, your disappointment, your hurt using your words and not attacking your partner's character or your partner's personality or a character flaw, something like that. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thanks so much for that clarification, the explanation. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Have Thank a great you. rest of your weekend. Hopefully Thank we you. see you again. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Bye, Danielle. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a great evening. Bye. All right.